Good evening viewers at home. My name is Dr. Luvio Dondono. This is our first lecture. But before I start, I would like to just to do this spiritual engagement with my ancestors, my personal ancestors and those of the African continent to speak through me and assist us in this struggle of decoloniality, of reclaiming our Africanness, of re-Africanization. Amako. This is our first lecture and uh, the day I would like you to keep in mind that this is done by the family so if there are any glitches pardon us uh, the theme for this lecture is called is called history CT of museums in Africa there are a couple of themes that I will cover in this history city of, of, of museums in Africa but however it is important uh, have to ponder a number of questions before we delve deeper into this. One is what consti what is a museum? We've all been to museums, but what is a museum? And also what constitutes what I call the white public taste? Because I'm, I'm arguing that museums form part of white public space, rather of white public taste, of gazing up upon what they view as rare, as unique, and also using human zoos. And also what are the key markers of the evolution of the concept of museums in Africa? Which I will speak further on that. And also, is the colonial framing of Africa still relevant? When you go to these museums that we have throughout the continent, do we see the features or the framing of, the, of, of colonialism in this, how they present things? And also map up the alternative, what can we do to, to, uh, to turn around the situation. So these are some of the questions that I will uh, respond to in this lecture. And also, it is also important to take into account that in order for us to understand this historicity, there are key issues that we need to look into. One is to use the Nitritude movement as a window to understand this evolution. And of course, we can't talk about the Nitritude movement without mentioning the likes of Damas and also, and also Du Bois. Further than that, another angle that helps us to understand this historicity is the, is the Afrocentricity. And there are a couple of scholars who have established themselves in theorizing Afrocentricity. And also the African philosophy. African philosophy will help us to understand and to unpack and to problematize the concept of museology and also this concept of re-Africanization or African personality or African humanity which has a long history. It is also important to understand the museums within the context of colonialism because museums were central in that as part of transculturation, as part of civilizing the of part of civilizing project. When we look at the struggling for Africa these white settlers conquering or colonizing the continent. There was also another, the undertone of that. So when we think about the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, we must know that it was not just about the partitioning of the continent, but it was also about cultural imposition, imposing their culture. And museums were central in that civilization project. And it is important that you can also draw parallels in Africa and also in other continents. And, and, and so museums have been central into that. And also museums form part of this curiosity. They wanted to know more about these people. They wanted to know more about us. So museums emerge as the curiosity, as a cabinet of curiosity. However, when we talk about colonialism, which is located in the context which locate and give a context what we are talking about. It is important that there are different waves of colonialism that we experience as Africans throughout the continent. They date back to 1497 and the recent one, we all know the colonization of the Cape of Good Hope and all that. But it is also important to look at the issue of the route, the spice route that existed during the Dutch East Indian Company route and also the British invasion. Because in this, uh, for instance, if you look at the Dutch East Indian Company and the British East Indian Company, there are routes 
that you can see of their trade from east to west and also going to the new world. And central to that, there was this exploration. They wanted to explore. And in going to other continents to explore, they also came into contact with the Africans and also wanted to know about their object and all that. So museums form part of that. So what is a museum? Or what constitutes a museum? A museum is a colonial construct. It is a colonial concept that form part of the transculturation project that we experience on the continent. Generally or loosely defined museums or a museum is a building which houses objects of social, cultural, historical and uh, scientific interest. Those objects can be used for exhibition. But looking through the evolution of the concept of museums, we then later experience what they call the living museums. So it's not just the object, but there are activities that they undertake to make these museums to be alive. And then closer, we also emerge, they also emerge the concept of the open air museum. That a museum does not have to be in a building. You don't use, rather you don't have to have a building in order to have a museum. So hence there is a concept of an open air museum. And there are also pieces of legislation in the South African context and also in other countries where they define the museum from, from, from a legislative point of view. And also, I'm giving this lecture bearing in mind that tomorrow is an International Museum Day, which is the 18th of May, the International Museum Day. The International Museum Day found expression in the evolution of, of, of the concept of museum on the continent and also globally. In recent times, they covered different themes. For instance, the theme like museums and communities, diversity and democracy, and intangible heritage, IKS, indigenous knowledge system. So these are some of the themes that they use for each year. I'm drilling deeper now to the, to, to the thesis of my, of my presentation the historicity of museums. When we talk about the historicity of museums in the context of colonialism, it is important to take into account the psychology of whiteness, or what is called the text of whiteness. What is whiteness? The text of whiteness refers to white superiority, white supremacy, domination and nationalism. Because it is in that context that we'll be able to understand the concept. And also, museums emerge or can also be understood in the context of civilizing the backward. So there's that discourse of the civilized and the backward dichotomy that you find in the history of museums. In this historicity of museums, there's also the element of frozen in time, that Africans were out of history and frozen in time. And as you'll see in the next slides later, where I'm leading this to George Hegel's Hegelian view on the African continent. Because there was this view that Africans were less human. And central to that also, there's this concept of nativism theory. The nativism theory that was used, and even today, when you go to museums, you'll see they will have beads that they call, these are Swahili beads, these are uh, uh, Kosa beads, or the Zulu beads, and all that, using the nationalities. But those are presented in a way that is Eurocentric. They are decontextualized and presented through, they are more of exoticized or assimilated from a Western understanding of an art. And museums are apolitical, are not apolitical. Museums, a museum is a political tool that is used to express certain views. There are four pillars that I will focus on in this historicity of museums. One is what I alluded to that museums emerge as a cabinet of curiosity. These white explorers, they traveled throughout the world and also on the continent. And when they interacted or came across with those people that were different from them, they wanted to know about those people because they were curious about this unfamiliar, uncommon, rare objects that these people were using. Hence, it was a cabinet. They emerged as a cabinet of curiosity. Also, at the beginning, museums were more of private spaces or private collection. 
where it, certain individuals they will keep these especially those from the royalties european royalties they will take african objects and keep them that's the 18th century but when you move to the mid 19th century you see a shift a shift from a symbol to complex museum now museums were no longer just about or being the, the cabinet of curiosity and also being symbol like the private space they became more of a public space now and also they moved from simple to complex and and especially if you zoom in in, in what he, uh, Tony Bennett called the exhibition complex taking into account the great exhibition of 1851 that's then you see the change and the departmentalization of museum to have education exhibition and all that but also museums what was happening outside museums found expression into the museums. For instance, if you look at the human displays and also racist science, you go to some of these museums in the 19th century, you will see human parts exhibited there because of this white taste and the evolution of museums. So the nature and scope of museums mid, mid 19th century changed, moved from being private to public. In the 20th century though, we also witnessed that Museums were caught up in a struggle for public taste. Museums were competing with other public initiatives. For instance, the fair, the, expo the expositions. Because also the expositions were also about the public taste and museums find themselves competing with those. Even though these took place in Europe and in America, but the impact was felt on the African continent, on how they presented us and how that was linked to the museums or to the emergence of museums. James Clifford is arguing that museums are conduct zones. But it is important, what do we mean when we say museums are conduct zones? For whom? By whom? And you will understand that, when you look into that, you, you understand that these spaces are spaces for dialogue, but for few, for certain individuals or for certain class. And this is also about being ourselves for you, where you find that Africans in this context have been presented in a particular way to satisfy other people. So in essence, Africans or their object of being themselves for one's view or for one's taste. Museums can also be spaces of conflict, where the attentions, politics of display, politics of presentation, gives or pave the way for the, for the conflicts and tensions in these museums. So museums have evolved and also the definition of museums has evolved over time. When we talk about the evolution of museums on the African continent and how these white explorers through this evolution collected the, 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 the African art, for instance, the mask that you find in West Africa, and the cultural objects that you find throughout the continent. There are three approaches that they usually use to exhibit them. One is to assimilate, is assimilation, meaning they view this art or this mask from a Western understanding of a mask, rather from a Western understanding of, a, of an art. They don't take into account the history and the significance of that object. And this is linked to intangible heritage because that mask without the associational links or the rituals that are performed in using the mask, the mask is meaningless. So it is the rituals that make that mask important. So from a Western point of view, when they assimilate those objects to a Western understanding, they are decontextualizing it and giving no meaning to that. That's another direction they usually take. This, the, the second one is exoticity where they will present this African object as backward, uncivilized, as something that are not important, with all the stigmas that are associated with the African continent. And in this process, you find that most of the time, these are, are historicized. They don't take into account the history and the significance, but it is the history and the sociology of the object that makes it important. And in presenting that, it is important to take into account the latter. But in the evolution of museums, we have realized that, or observed that this, the latter was not taken into account, so the objects were either assimilated or exoticized, meaning the value, losing the value of that. And this paved the way for the politics of display. The second pillar of this historicity of museums is racist science. 
what do I mean about racist science or what is the link between the racist science and the evolution of museums? Let's just zoom in into one individual, Charles Darwin, the father of Darwinism, the social hierarchy. Darwin believed that white people are better than black people. Black people were inferior. So the inferiority and superiority complex dates way back. So James Darwin was one of the leading scientists when it comes to human evolution who perpetuated the view that Africans are less human, are animals like animality, less human, inferior to black or rather inferior to white people. And, and, and there are masterpieces that he wrote, a number of books, where he emphasized the point that uh, white people are better than, the, the, are better than Africans. And he, in this period, you also find expression of this in museums, how they will present and collect the African history, how they will collect and, and present the, the African heritage, the parts of human beings that uh, were presented in this exhibition. So science, the racist science, influenced the presentation and the images of presenting Africans in museums. And also it is through this age of Darwin, or Darwinism theory, where you see this nativism, this ethnicity being uh, 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 coming to the fore. And also there are parallels that we can draw here. If we look in Europe around 1898 and also even earlier than that, Africans were on stage, were on stage, where they would parade, whether through human zoos, or in expositions, for instance, those that were held in Chicago, Philadelphia, and St. Louisiana, and many other places. And it is also in this context that we will understand what Saki Batman experienced. Because it was part of science, racist science, biological curiosity, where they will take people and display them for public viewing, for gazing, on these people who are less human. So this racist science influenced that the taste of, of the museum goers. And also it is in this period that you will see now, and even later into the 20th century, where the natural history museums will present or conserve or claim to conserve the history of the indigenous people. Feeding to the concept feeding to the ideology of Darwin and other people that I will talk about, like Hegel, who said people Africans were backward and close to nature. So by having African culture in a natural museum, you are qualifying the perception that Darwin and many others have purported that Africans are close to nature. And this was dominant in the, in the 18th century and 19th century and also early 20th century. And also in 1816, there was what was called the Horton Tots then where people were taken and the Zulu choir to go to these European countries and perform for the taste, for the public taste. So natural history museums were caught up in this discourse of trying to justify or they were singing from the same hymn book as the were racist scientists that presented the concept of Africans being close to nature. There are many museums that can be cited in this, both in America and also on the continent. But also, what became dominant in this period is the issue of human remains. The human remains continue even to the present. One of the great, uh, uh, of the great scholars or scientists, uh, Philip Tobias, collected human remains that are kept in one of the museums at Vets in South Africa. And these human remains are linked to the Khoi and Sen or to the indigenous people of the continent. They were robbing the graves because they wanted to know more about these people to study their, 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 their human remains. So this should be understood in the context of this racist science, biological curiosity, which we continue to live with it even to the present. And even now, even if we can follow the story of human remains throughout the continent, in Namibia, in Ghana, in many other African countries, this is dominant even now. But now, you will find that the human remains are kept in people's offices. Because these human remains are for Africans, which also 
perpetuate or is in line with the view that Africans are less human. So the issue of human remains and this curiosity and the racist science is also in line. And Sivaz Rousseau has written in the, in, uh, about this issue of human remains. The third element of this, of the markers of the evolution of museums on the African continent is philosophy or philosophers and racism. And there's no better example than Hegel, the German philosopher called Hegel. The Hegelian view, as I mentioned earlier on, viewed black people as backward, uncivilized. And, 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 and in one of his books, Geographical Basis of the World History, in this masterpiece, he excluded Africa as part of the world history. And also he presented this understanding that Africans were backward and under, uh, backward. The same argument you'll also have or observe in Karl Marx when he argued that Africans should be kept in zoo. And these are great philosophers who influenced the thinking at the time. But they are element of racism. So even philosophy was not immune from what was done by other scientists to shape and influence the public taste. And also this contributed to this myth about Africa, that Africa has no history, is out of history. And this you see this in these museums that I, I cited even to the present. And also the Egypt or the early African civilization is not, is decontrolized or not presented in, a, in its proper sense in, in these museums. The last aspect of this historicity is public taste. And, and, and I will just give more details on this public taste. What is, uh, what, what is white public taste? White public taste refers to the gaze of what white people would like to see. Remember museums emerge or museums are colonial construct. White people or European settlers had a perception which was informed by this racist science, cabinet of curiosity, and these philosophers that were racist, viewing Africans as less human, close to nature, backward. Hence you'll find that the cultural history of Africans was kept or presented in natural history museums. So, this publication was about gazing on black people, whether it's in a museum, is in its exposition and all that. So, that's another aspect that was dominant in the 1800s. Throughout the world, you, look, you can look in London, in America, in Madagascar, and Africans were taken to be on stage to satisfy the white taste. And that was also represented, if you go to the museum, you also observe the same thing in museum, this white taste. And this unfamiliar, if you go or you look at the Philadelphia Museum, there's a case of an African-American that was skinned because the scientists, they wanted to know more about these people. So this white public taste continued. And if you can also focus or look at this in the American context, the lynching in America, there were slaves and they would lynch them. They would hang them on the tree or under the bridge, they would lynch them and most of the time even burn them alive. And they would commercialize that. That was more an outing for white people and their kids to go there and see and gaze and this less human being hang there. So it was part of satisfaction. It was part of this white public taste that was, that was obsessed with black people, viewing them as inferior. And this also finds its expression in museums. So this white public taste is complex and it also relates to issues of, 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 of human zoos, which I will speak now about them. But there's also this racialized and exoticized the other, which you also find at the museum. Because this white taste is also about the text of whiteness. It's also about the psychology of whiteness. White being superior, white being better, white being advanced and civilized and Africans being backward. So this, there is a link in this aspect. The Pennsylvania University School of Medicine, there's an exhibition there that epitomized exactly what I just highlighted and the lynching in America. So 
Central to this white public taste is this biological curiosity. The story of Saki Batman. Saki Batman taken in, in, in Cape Town, well, now it's called Cape Town, to, and then traveled Europe. This is what was in one of the museums in Europe where where she was presented and people will come at this museum to look at this naked woman who's different who's different from white people or who look different according to them and this was a, a part of this white public taste and museums were centered in this initiative. This points to a number of issues, not just racism, but lack of professional ethics. And of course, you can't expect professional ethics from the museologists of that time because of the dominant ideology of racism, of the dominant ideology that was influenced by people like Darwin. So, Museums are not apolitical. Museums are not neutral spaces. Museums mirror what is happening outside there. So those politics, racialized politics that were, exp that were experienced at the time, influence the way Africans will be exhibited on the continent and also outside the continent. And also this reflection. So this pol the politics of, of display then became dominant. And, and, and this story, the story of Saki Batman from 1810 to 1815, visiting or being showcased in London and France. Being showcased in London and France, Saki Batman, and also in this museum. When, when she died, she was then, uh, uh, the board was then exhibited in this. So this is nothing more than a racist science and this white taste to satisfy the white taste. There's also the element of this white taste that relates to human zoos, where they will take Africans, Africans and go, they will put them in a cage, put them in a cage for white people to come and walk around and look at them. And this was dominant in the 1800s up until the early 20th century. In different parts of the world, Africans were being exhibited in human zoos and also even in museums. And there are many countries that participated or practiced this culture of white public taste. And this also find expression on the continent in museums on the continent. So, for instance, if we can talk about the fair, the welfare in 1889, where 400 people came to view or to gaze at these Africans who were kept in this cage for white public taste, to gaze upon black people. And as I said, this continued for a number of, for, for a number of years and there are a number of exhibitions that were, exhibi that were hosted for instance in France and many other places. We can talk about the 1901, 1922, and also up to 1930, and go back to 1800s. There was also this one of 1906, where a Congolese, there's a, a woman that was taken from Congo and was displayed in New York City. Monkey Cage. She was put in a cage. She was put in a cage. So, museums. So, this link of natural history museums keeping or housing the culture of Africans is linked to this concept of Darwinism and other philosophers like Hegel. And, and, and as I said, this is, was, was a common practice in one of the oldest museums on the African continent is in Cape Town, South African National History Museum. 
and he said this museum where you find that the concept of, the concept of Bushman diorama was evident. And, 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 and this is the slide that shows that this is the Bushman diorama. And I must punctuate this point by saying dioramas or the use of dioramas in museums is a common practice. But it becomes problematic when it is presented from the concept of otherness or from the point of view of presenting others as less human. And the same time, diorama, you find it in recent times at East London Museum where Bushmen are still presented in the same way. I will use this term, I know it's politically incorrect, but that's how this diorama was called, the Bushman diorama. And even in the 1980s, they had this exhibition in Cape Town, in Cape Town at, at this Natural History Museum. What is important to understand here or to note is that in these dioramas, the Koyan Sen or the Bushmen were presented as backward, uncivilized. And this fit into that. And that, for instance, in the 1990s, the use of diorama always sparked a debate from those people who are associated or who are the descendants of those. But you also experience the same thing even in, in America, where they will have exhibitions of the indigenous people in America who will be exhibited in Natural History Museum. So this is a concept that is linked with colonialism, conquering the other, and imposing your culture and, and also your worldview on others as I said, that they view them as less human. So, central to it is also this, this concept of politics of otherness. However, when you move closer now, if you look at the museums then and now, there are some strides or changes that have occurred. But these changes are part of the transformation agenda in South Africa. These changes, which are part of the transformation agenda, I argue, are just an add-on approach. They are not dealing with the fundamentals of museums. They are not dealing with the fundamental of presenting Africa in a different way. They are not dealing or dismantling the concept of the framing of museums. And in recent times, some of these museums are also caught up in this politics of otherness. And if you look at, for instance, at the District 6 Museum when it, in its early days, there was this element of coloredness in South Africa in, at the District 6 Museum where they would focus on, in the main on the first removals that were experienced in that area when District 6 was declared a white area on the 11th of February 1966. And in my honours paper I argue that the destruction of District 6 started as far as 1901 when there was a Papanic plate and Africans were removed to Ndabeni at 8 Flair who later became Ndabeni. And where, because of the first shop land, people were moved, and also in 1960. And then it was then declared in, in the, on, on the 11th of February 1966 a, a white area. So sometimes museums find themselves caught up in the politics of otherness. And sometimes with the view of wanting to affirm one ethnic group over the other. And the same can be said about the Robben Island Museum. The Robben Island Museum, which is caught up in the discourse of a victor and the loser or Victor Loser Complex, where you find that the ruling party in South Africa is presenting a certain narrative of the history of Robben Island. And the images that you experience there is in line with the national images that you experience in the country, in this craft of curating the nation. The nation is curated by the state. How to remember the past and what to remember and what to exclude. And that is evident at District 6, rather, is evident at the Robin Island Museum. In closing, though, it is important that we don't just view museums as, as construct, as colonial construct. With all the politics that are involved, the politics of display and also politics of, of, of presentation. But what can we do to change them? What can we do to retell our story? What can we do to dismantle the, the conception of the concept or to dismantle the framework of the museums? 
This then is taking us to the alternatives. The alternatives then are important because these museums now, even this was, was the case in the past and even now, they are still perpetuating this uh, tribalized or racialized historiography of the country. Racialized historiography of the continent. So it is important that we move and find alternative. And I'm arguing, I affirm the point that in African context, curators in African museums are more of social commentators. What you present or how you present the past or the culture, it is important. Then we need to move away from that and, and, and I'm, mapping, I'm making suggestions of what can constitute the alternative framework. The alternative framework is also anchored on the, a number of pillars. One is the inclusion of intangible heritage. That when you exhibit this art object, for instance, the mask from West Africa, you bring in the sociology of the art. You bring in the history and the cultural practice that is associated with that. That will give more meaning and the value to the object. And also other aspects of intangible. The use of the IKS or indigenous knowledge system. Because it is through indigenous knowledge system that will be able to see the Africanness or the sight or the knowledge of the other of the indigenous people. So it, it is important that there is that. And also reinterpretation or redefining the museum or redefining the space. So it is important that we will redefine them from an African point of view that will take into account all these ingredients that I mentioned. And also the participation of the community. Museums form part of the cultural struggle, as I mentioned earlier on. Therefore, it is important that, which is the third point of this alternative, we anchor this discourse on the African methods of conservation, African method of knowledge production, African method of cultural, historical, material keeping. How Africans have been keeping their culture, history from one generation to the next. That constituted the alternative that I'm putting forward. That we need to have those kind of alternative for our, for our African culture. And this differs from one region to another, but they are unique. They are uniquely African. In conclusion, museums, throughout the history of the museums, we observe a common denominator. And the common denominator is anchored in the politics of otherness. Politics of otherness that are informed, on, informed by the four pillars that I mentioned. Cabinet of curiosity, because the white settlers or the explorers were seeing something that was they were not they were unfamiliar with, rare. Then we have this racist science, Darwinism feeding to the people close to nature. Then we had the philosophers or philosophy and racism, Hegel. Then we have this white public taste, where white people were gazing on Africans, whether it's in a form of human zoo, in a form of museum, and also the case of Shaggy Padman, and many other people were taken from the continent to go and fulfill the white taste. So I'm arguing that central to that was this politics of otherness, this text of whiteness, the psychology of whiteness, white being superior and better. And, and, and to some extent, this politics of otherness still continue even to the present. But we also get to understand colonial consciousness. That in this context, what is also predominant is the colonial consciousness. The consciousness or the dominant ideology or the worldview at the time, which was framed by colonialism, find its expression in museums. In the process of re-Africanization, I'm arguing that we need to re-Africanize, to go back what many Africanists, even in the 18th century, even those who moved from, during the period of going back to Africa, the former slaves moved to countries like, like Sierra, Le Sierra Leone and, Liger and, and Liberia. And one of the thinkers of that movement came up with the concept of African personality. And this African personality was about reclaiming 
or going back to our history, going back to our heritage. That was disrupted by colonialism, by slavery. And then in the 20th century, Nkwame Nrumah promoted the same ideology with his signature, of course. So African personality from part, from part of this re-Africanization and same as the concept of African humanity. So these are, kind of, are important in the process of re-Africanization and in promoting this art of this re-Africanization. It is important when it comes to museums, we promote methods or tools that are based on African worldview. Tools of tools that will promote the social and cultural and history of Africans as the repositories of African culture. Thank you, Tamako.